the latest arrivals off the flight from Hamburg. For these men, life in the desert kingdom has just begun. A couple of points, both to do with dress. A number of you will have these jungle hats already. In the next couple of days, you will get the desert equivalent of the jungle hat. You know, the hat floppy ridiculous. The ruling for the wearing of the hat is on the head with the brim all the way down, all the way round, all of the time. <laughs> You're not permitted to wear it the sort of second-hand car salesman look, and the ascot look is definitely out. So, brims all the way down, all the way round, all of the time. Right, follow me, please. It's hot and sticky. It stinks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> There's not much else you can say about it, really, is it? This is the place they call Tent City. For at least 2,000 desert rats, it'll be home for some time to come. An army marches on its stomach, and in Tent City, they're fortunate to have fresh food supplied by the Saudis. In deference to the army's Muslim hosts, pork and bacon are off the menu. Up until, I think it was yesterday morning, we were getting uh, the American rations, but not like they're getting in the base, the stuff they're taking out to the boys at the front. And uh, it basically looked like a pile of mush. Uh, it was calories, but it wasn't very nice. This food is much better now since we got the British cooks. And the conditions those cooks work under are gruelling. By midday, the kitchen tent will be like a sauna. We'll start work at 4 o'clock preparing breakfast. Breakfast meal goes on from 6 o'clock till 7. Then they will clear down and we we'll start the preparation for lunch. We're splitting it into two shifts. There's an early shift and a late shift. And although the late shift, if everything's prepared, can get a little break in the afternoon. Because of the conditions, we need to have a break like that. Come on, we should have them loaded by now. Get them on. <laughs> After the weeks of intensive training, the pace is much slower now. The troops need time to acclimatise. Because it takes approximately nine seconds for the uh, hydrogen cyanide to actually build up in a lethal dose. So Always at the back up, of the mind here is the risk of it. chemical attack. Learning to cope with such a scenario is a top priority. Not too particularly worried at this stage about your hood. However, the essential thing is that if you haven't got a respirator on correctly, you're now taking in lethal doses. One of the biggest problems I've noticed is you're not putting your chins in first. Put them in and then pull the respirator over the rest of the head. Let's work in pairs, sort ourselves out. Smithfield Market is what they call this giant warehouse. Up to 5,000 people live here, 
and it's also where the commander runs his operation. General, I got you together today because we're just going to discuss how we're going to lay this range out before I then discuss with the people who are going to fire the ammunition in what way they're going to do that. What, what we've got to accept is we've got a situation now where everybody's up and running as far as firing weapons. It's a constant round of briefings, briefings in the morning, and then when the day has gone through and the problems have arisen, then further briefings in the, in the afternoon. We have, we have a succession in the morning, and then in the evening in particular, the, the staff have one at six, and then we have a, a large briefing at seven, which ends at about half past eight in the evening. Then the next thing, of course, we've got to report the whole thing back to the headquarters in Riyadh, and by the time that's all finished, it's 10 o'clock, and it's time to try and get some sleep. As the temperature soars, environmental health experts measure the heat and humidity. Every hour, they have to update what's known as a heat stress index. Well, the uh, heat stress index uh, at the moment is 34 to 35. It gets above 32 about 10 o'clock in the morning and remains above 32 until 1, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And it's about that sort of temperature that we then uh, would want people to reduce the amount of work as much as possible, reduce heavy work, even for troops who are acclimatised. They're based in what was West Germany in the Saltair region. Saltair, S-O-L-T-A-U. Out in the midday sun today, there are no mad dogs, but on the quayside there are plenty of Englishmen. They're all here to meet the ship Sir Bedivere. On board, a cargo of Challenger tanks. The Desert Rat emblems, were they thought of before the, just before this campaign? No, 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 no. The Desert Rat was uh, the sorry, emblem sorry. which no, belonged to the... We're actually wearing it on your, on your sleeve. Oh, yes. Because we knew it was on the, on the, on the regimental colours and what have you. But we, on the brigade. On the brigade colours, sorry. Well, brigade banner, yes. Yeah. But the brigade is a, um, an entity which doesn't actually stay together like a regiment or a battalion does. Uh -huh. The brigade will change its composition. Yeah. with the rulement of regiments and units and so on. It was just some confusion about whether or not they'd been worn on the sleeve no, before now. No, in fact, uh, going back to the days when I joined and when Peter joined, uh, when we wore battle dress, we used to wear the brigade and, uh, and divisional signs on our battle dress. Yes. But as soon as we, we, we dropped that uh, uniform and went into service dress in the 60s, then we, we stopped wearing uh, formation signs. Was it the idea of the brigadier to, to wear? I really don't know. It creates an esprit de corps. Absolutely. You know. Over the last three or four days, basically, we've been meeting the press very, very early, uh, arranging different types of facilities, interviews, press conferences for them. And then, of course, we have our wash up at the end of the day and a debriefing session and look forward to the following the activities in the following week. An extremely good rapport is being built up between the press here and the military. Uh, we're getting tremendous feedback from them. And I think in our turn, we're laying on some extremely good facilities for them. Hey, move us. Next nine, two, three. Next one. Back in Smithfield Market, some of the men are being measured up for their new desert kit. It's it's not it's not too bad actually. It's better than the actual jungle kit we came over in. Slightly thinner, so it's actually keeping us as, as cool as possible. People who normally play in military bands are now adjusting to their war role as stretcher bearers. You can slide your hands under here and grab interlock them with the guy in the middle, OK? And then that's to get the, the uh, stretcher and slide it underneath, OK? So, right, OK, up. It's quite comfortable like that. And then we can just gent gently lower him down onto the stretcher. OK, always talking to you casually to reassure him. At the moment, we're just doing basic training with some of the bandsmen that we've got and just actually uh, doing a demonstration, the sweat's just pouring off of you. 
and that's just very, very light work. So imagine the sort of problems we're going to have uh, out in the desert. With much of the equipment still to arrive, many people find there isn't a lot to do here. So for the moment, the middle of the day is considered siesta time. During the day, it's boring, really. You get play cards, go fishing out the back, or write letters, read books, really. There's not a lot to do until we can go out to other locations to issue the ammunition. So it's PT on a night and just stuff like that, really. Not a lot. It should be in, but then again, I don't think we should. It's sort of mixed feelings about it. The guys don't think we belong here, but we're out to prove that we should be in. It's been pretty boring at the moment because obviously there's nothing to do. Uh, we spend a lot of time indoors and we have uh, ads. Uh, but yeah, we're, uh, we're eager, ready to go. Outside, it's still hotter than any summer's day back home, but the temperature is beginning to drop. Some communications equipment has just been delivered and it's now being tested by the Royal Signals. Basically just making sure everything's really working that we checked out when we was in Verdun. Making sure the masks go up and stay up and just checking the generators work, wagons work and all the communication equipment goes all right. The heat is our worst thing because it just overheats the equipment and it tends to send it up the creek. And the heat provides little comfort for mechanics in the tank workshop. We've uh, got a mod program, as you can see. Uh, we're modding these tanks for the desert conditions. And uh, as we're just starting up this line at the moment, we've got a, a few little mods that need to be done on the engines, air filtration systems, so on and so forth. And we're just gradually working through it step by step until we get accustomed to what we've, uh, we've got to do. And then we'll get into the full swing of things. Well, obviously, the, the tanks have run up already and they are pretty warm when they actually come in. So when you actually go to work on them, you're boiling, and you actually have to work on them, just overheating all the time. It's getting quite bad, actually. But that's the work. OK, then, gas, gas, gas. One, six seconds. One, two, three, four, ah, God, 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 God. five, six. Right, hoods up, start doing the buddy-buddy system. More chemical warfare lessons, but this time a stage further. How to stay uncontaminated and launch a SAM missile at the same time. Target engagement on one aircraft. Okay, so carry out the normal drills that you carry out. Okay, happy? Target! Let's go. We've been here five days now and we have done a lot of training, whether it be NBC training or weapon training. All the normal training. We've been doing a lot of training back in Germany, and then when we come over here, we started fresh again, going over the points that we covered in Germany. Unload. Okay, fine. You got to be a bit quicker, yeah. On the re-engagement. Okay, same again. Let's shout it a bit louder. There's going to be a lot of a lot of noise in the battlefield. Let's get it louder, OK? Contrary to the popular view, it wasn't just the engineers who built Tent City. The pioneers claim they did much of the work, and now it's finished, they're displaying other skills. At the moment, we're making some benches up for the kooks because they're working under hotter conditions than we are. So they want a couple of benches just so they can relax when they get five or ten minutes. Um, so that's what we're doing as well, knocking some up for them. Plus, making some benches for the four tunners um, so we can travel around in comfort as well.
Links with the outside world here matter a lot. The postman is a popular visitor. His approval rating is even better today because for the first time in three days, he's brought some newspapers. Not everyone's choice, but welcome nevertheless. We're just starting to get the papers in now, really, in a good way. And they're about, say, four, maybe five days behind. But we're hoping, as time goes on, they'll start getting through a lot quicker. Like, maybe tomorrow you might get yesterday's paper, only having a two-day gap in between them. But we just got to wait and see. Another reminder of home is the NAFI. It's run by a team of volunteers who, under normal circumstances, work for NAFI as civilians. When we're out here, we're classed as military. We're, we're all given the rank. You have to be at least corporal. You know, that's because you're handling the money and stuff like that. But back home, we're just civilians. We're, as soon as we get back, we get discharge papers, so we don't have to stay for three years or anything like that. We're starting to buy local purchases now because it's a lot cheaper, and they've got a lot of stuff that we, we use at home anyway. Kit Kats, Mars, and just about everything we can get. We can get it cheaper, so we're buying it local. We've got um, a naffy buyer who's out here, and he's supplying it the whole lot. It's going around seeing all the merchants and that. For the camp barber, there's now been some unexpected competition. As well as being a soldier, Private Louise Higgins is also a fully qualified hairdresser. Do his tash, Nick. Oh, 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 <laughs> 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 Pride and joy, that's only 29 years to grow it. <laughs> all the lads love it because they get it done for nothing. So, it's good. <laughs> In Tent City, the day draws to a close. For many, it's a chance to wind down. The lads are uh, doing quite well, but um, shortly we should start going under the weather. We have the odd party now and again, just to simulate what we ain't getting, as well as beer. Wish. <laughs> <laughs> Away from the carefree atmosphere of Tent City, a British-American military police patrol takes to the highway. Such cooperation symbolic of a close relationship between these transatlantic partners. Along the route, a sobering reminder of what now unites many other nations. These oil fields are regarded as a key military target. But as the multinational ring of steel tightens around Iraq, how long the desert rats must stay here is a question no one can answer. <laughs>